Hello, everyone. Uh, today I have with me for a second time uh, Father Stephen de Young, and uh, we will talk about his new book uh, that's called Apocrypha, an Introduction to Extra Biblical Literature. And you saw the book. <laughs> now. <laughs> so, Father Stephen, welcome a second time uh, to this channel. Thank you. Um, it's good to be back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those that perhaps are new to the channel, uh, do you want to give a brief introduction uh, to yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm the pastor of uh, Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, and uh, I've written several books, the newest one of which I just sort of Vanna Whited for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about today, um, Religion of the Apostles. The first one I wrote is probably the best known one. There are a couple more. Um, and I'm the co-host of the Lord of Spirits podcast with Father Andrew Damick. And my parish Bible study is also uh, put out as a podcast uh, by Ancient Faith Ministries under the title, The Whole Council of God. Um, those are the main things. There's yeah. probably more stuff. But <laughs> right. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe we can start with the question why you wanted to write about uh, about the Apocrypha. Yeah. So um, there are, and we should probably define should probably the distinguish. word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, right away. So um apocrypha is a category of books of texts uh from the ancient world uh a lot of times western folks especially protestant folks are used to thinking of um the canon of the bible in sort of a binary way it's like it's a one or a zero right? it's either in the bible and therefore 100 percent authoritative right 100 percent true or it's outside the bible and therefore zero percent zero percent true if we're talking about ancient texts um and in reality when you look at the discussions about canonicity uh in the early church particularly in the east there were actually three categories uh there were books that were read publicly which are what we would call canonical books there were books uh, that were not to be read, which is what we would call heretical books, like Gnostic texts and that kind of thing. And then there was this middle category of books that were good to be read privately. And so if, if you look up the definition of the word apocrypha, you get something like hidden or secret, which makes it sound terribly mysterious. And... You get these documentaries about these books where it's like banned from the Bible or, you know, here's here's the books that church doesn't want you to read, you know. Um, but the reality is Apocrypha, like you could tell from hidden and secret that private as opposed to public right, is also one of the meanings. And that's what it means in this case. Right. So we have to remember that in the ancient world, most people couldn't read. Until very recently, most people couldn't read in history um, and were literate. So a book that was read publicly in church would be being read to everyone. Right? Whereas a book that was only to be read privately, automatically for someone to be literate, to have access to what were very expensive texts, to be able to read and study them, You'd have to have a certain level of education. You'd probably have to be ordained in most of the Christian world, right? So this would be a group of people who was sort of able to read these other texts and sort of sift out, here's the good stuff, here's the bad stuff, here's the worthwhile stuff, here's the less worthwhile stuff. Uh, whereas you wouldn't want to read those out loud publicly because sort of the general populace might not be able to do that as effectively and might be misled, might not know, should should I believe this, all of this? or should I, um, 
So when we're talking about the apocrypha, we're talking about that category of books. And so in the in the United States, at least, and I think in a lot of Protestant countries, when people refer to the apocrypha with the definite article, they're referring to a set of books that are different between the Roman Catholic and Protestant Old Testament canons. So Judith, Tobit, First and Second Maccabees, right? Um, several other books. So um, some people have already, they read the title of my book and they think it's about <laughs> those books. But that's that's not really, when you get into it, that's not really a different use of the word apocrypha because the argument between Protestants and Roman Catholics historically was, are these books part of the Old Testament or not? And the Protestant answer was, no, they're apocrypha. No, they're in this other category. Whereas the Roman Catholic Church said, no, they're canonical. So the word apocrypha always refers to this middle category as an Orthodox priest and an Orthodox person in general. I don't think Tobit, Judith, et cetera, are in the apocrypha category. I think they're in the public, right? They're in the canonical Old Testament category. Um, so these these books, uh, the book is divided into two sections uh, of Old Testament related texts and New Testament related texts. Uh, so the Old Testament related texts are primarily works of Second Temple Jewish literature. The Second Temple period was from about 500 BC to 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Um, and that period, there are Jewish writings in that period that are not part of, um, in the case of what the book covers, not part of almost anybody's Old Testament. There are a few texts in there that are part of the Ethiopian canon, although I'm told by Ethiopian people that while we say that all the time, the borders of their borders of their Old Testament canon are sort of a dotted line, <laughs> I guess, for what they tell me um, when I've talked to them about it. Um, there are in the first chapter, I deal with a couple of books, uh, Fourth Maccabees and Fourth Ezra, that you sometimes find in appendices in Orthodox Bibles, and which is a weird, you know, what's the canonical status of an appendix? You know, that's so they're sort of at the edge of the canon, but mostly we're talking about Second Temple Jewish literature like the Book of Enoch, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, Joseph and Asenath, those kind of things. And then the New Testament section, we're talking about like the Acts of various apostles, the Acts of Thomas, the Acts of Peter, um, some other texts like the Apocalypse of Peter, some non canonical gospels. Um, and, uh, so the, my main reason for writing about this already in religion of the apostles, I had talked a lot about things in the first part of the book, right? Second temple Jewish literature and how understanding more about the diversity and the contours of Judaism at the time of Christ and the apostles sheds a lot of light on the New Testament and on the early church. And, you know, the one the one complaint people still lodge against Religion of the Apostles is the quantity of footnotes. So I have said this new book in some way is a lot of those footnotes if you're talking about Second Temple literature. So by going through these different texts and giving sort of introductions to them, pointing out some important or influential bits and pieces and ideas in them, um, I'm hoping people will be able to read them, and also that uh, this will point to some of the things I was referring to in Religion of the Apostles, and where these ideas then show up in the New Testament, in other early Christian sources, in our liturgics, in the Orthodox Church, in some cases, um, the lives of saints, and those kind of things. Uh you mentioned the deuterocanonical books, and one question I think many would have is, were those books considered, let's say, uh, scripture by the, the fathers? And, and maybe you can also say something about 
the criteria we are or the criteria we are using to define something as scripture you you have already mentioned the um, reading you know the texts uh, yeah. aloud in the church are there more criteria that we can identify yeah well this may be myth busting you will find in books a uh, list of ca canonical criteria for books but almost all of those are sort of ex post facto they're after the fact um the reality is um canons like if we're talking about the old testament we have to talk about canons because it's different um in different ancient churches not just different modern churches different ancient churches um they arose through tradition meaning organically in the lives of these churches there were texts that they were reading publicly and texts that they weren't um or texts that they knew about and valued and texts that they didn't know about or didn't have access to um and so with the Old Testament, with the Deuterocanonicals, um, the question of did the fathers recognize them as canonical it depends on which father. Um, so uh, St. Augustine, for example, just talking about the West now, St. Augustine, for example, uh, recognized them as canonical and part of the Old Testament. Uh, St. Jerome did not but translated them anyway into Latin as part of his translation project. Even though in his prologues to different books, he said they're not canonical um, or not. They don't have the same status, right? He was basically putting them in that second category, uh, that middle category. Um, and in the West, uh, that was a debate leading all the way up to the Protestant Reformation. One of Martin Luther's main debate opponents was a Roman Catholic cardinal who before the Reformation started had published a treatise on why the Deuterocanonicals were not canonical. <laughs> but then when the Protestant Reformation happened, and this is true in a lot of places in terms of the medieval Western tradition, um, there were all of these internal debates within the medieval Western church that at the time of the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant reformers took one side and then the counter reformation at trent took the other took the other side so the first time an official old testament canon for rome was declared was at the council of trent mm -hmm. in the 16th century until then there was never sort of an official declaration local councils had said things um for their own churches about their own practice um but uh they had not so really it's it's it was something that happened organically, and especially with the Old Testament, uh, there doesn't seem to have been a lot of arguing about it. Hmm. Uh, we don't have records, even before Chalcedon, of like people going and arguing with Ethiopians. <laughs> right? You should you shouldn't be reading this book of Baruch. How dare you? Right? Um, <laughs> like the, it just doesn't seem to have happened yeah. with the Old Testament. Um, but that makes sense if you have this middle category. Yeah. Right. Where if you have these categories, the debate is, should you read this publicly? Should it be read privately? And realistically, uh, the Eastern churches, as far as I can tell, now people have claimed to be otherwise, but they've never shown me evidence otherwise, never had a thoroughgoing Old Testament lectionary. And by thoroughgoing, I mean, our New Testament lectionary, you read through the whole New Testament mm -hmm. every year other than the book of Revelation, right? Following the the readings. There is, I, I've never found any evidence and I've had people tell me there isn't any evidence, people who are experts on this, that there was ever a, uh, a lectionary for the Old Testament in the Eastern churches that covered everything, where you read like the whole Old Testament canon for that church. Um, we still have, of course, you're right, you read Genesis during Lent, you yeah. read, you know, certain books, but not a lectionary where we could point at it and say, oh, well, see, you read all of First Maccabees, <laughs> right, uh, where we could sort of demonstrate that. So if it's not actually being publicly read, then the difference between those two categories becomes kind of academic hmm. and not something we really need to go to the mat and fight about. 
you get more disagreements with the New Testament because the New Testament was being in full read publicly. Yeah. So there were questions like, should we be reading the book of Revelation publicly? Right? Or is this something that should only be read, you know, in private? Because, you know, there's parts that are hard to understand. People have noticed um, <laughs> the book of Revelation. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And then, and then most of those criteria were come to sort of after the fact where they said, well, you know, like with the mm -hmm. New Testament, it was written by an apostle. Yeah. You know, but um, there's there's less of that at the time. Like, there doesn't seem to have been a serious debate about the canonicity of Hebrews, even though there were churches that used it and churches that didn't. You don't see a lot of people fighting that it's not canonical, even though everybody was arguing about who wrote it, even among the fathers. Yeah. <laughs> right? So if it turns, some of them held that St. Paul didn't write it, but that didn't mean they wanted to, you know, stop reading it publicly. Yeah. So that's what I mean when I say a lot of those categories are after the fact. We're looking at the canon we've received and saying, well, what are some general traits we can see about these books that we've received already? Yeah. Yeah. So how are we Orthodox? How are we supposed to think about the question if the canon is closed, you know? <laughs> um people are you know saying things like uh, if we were to find a new letter from saint paul would that be scripture or uh, so yeah what do you think about those kind of questions yeah so i think as orthodox christians we're in a we're in a better position to just sort of accept historical reality is how i would put it <laughs> um if if you're coming at it from a Protestant perspective, right, where your argument about, well, this these books are canonical because they're self-attesting, meaning just you read them and you can tell that it's scripture, mm -hmm. things get kind of subjective, right, and, and individualized, and you can have sort of these arguments. But since the historical fact is we have received a canon, we received a set of texts, from from our holy tradition and as orthodox christians we believe the holy spirit was in charge of and guiding that process right then we sort of have to go no further right these are the texts that are read so sometimes people will ask me oh do you think the book of enoch is canonical and it's like that's not a question you think about right that's an objective thing no that book is not read publicly in my church right it it isn't it doesn't have that kind of authority in my church. So for me, it is not. Um, if you're a member of an Ethiopian Orthodox church, then you're going to have a different answer to that. But it's still an objective question about what texts hold authority in your church. So if we found a new book, uh, the immediate answer would be no, it would not be canonical, right? Because it's not a book that we've received, right? As, as, part of our tradition um and we don't hold something as is is scripture just because saint paul wrote it right like if we found a note he wrote or a grocery list right we wouldn't say oh this is scripture right yeah, yeah. if we found and the question of well what if we found the epistle to the laodiceans okay. right <laughs> the authentic one because there are a bunch of fake ones in the ancient church circulating around yeah. um you know, that that seems at first like a different question, but the immediate answer would be the same. The immediate answer would be no. Why do I say the immediate answer? Well, it's entirely possible, right, that if we did find that, and if we, for sure, this is it, right? And if there was an ecumenical council, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> and the bishops of the whole church gathered, Right. And, and issued a ruling and said, we're adding this to the lectionary. Right. If all of those hypotheticals came to pass, and that seems so far fetched to anyone who understands how the Orthodox Church works today, <laughs> that it would take a miracle. It would take an act of the Holy Spirit for all of that to happen. Yeah. Right. Then hypothetically, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. That kind of situation. Yes, exactly. And, um, I think it was Saint Siloan that said 
that if you know all the scriptures were to be erased for some reason uh, the fathers would just write a new set of scriptures and it's like um yeah i don't know if you agree with that what do you think what what you're thinking if what your thoughts are of statements like that but i think the point here is that it's not we are not expecting new revelation like the fourth person of the trinity is waiting to reveal himself we we don't believe in anything (laughs) like that but uh, i think for some saints like siluan who had the the presence the presence of god really um, uh, in his heart he felt that the spirit is present today as it were you know before i think that's the wider yeah point he's making there yeah yeah and well and what he said there is building on a long tradition that goes back Mm -hmm. into pre-christian judaism that's reflected like in fourth ezra one of the texts (laughs) that i talk about in the book and i had a journal article published about this because saint jerome mentions it too um this tradition that there there are you see it in the epistle of uh, barnabas too actually that i talk about in the book Mm -hmm. um there was a tradition in Second Temple Judaism that you find in various places that actually all the copies of the Torah, right, all the copies of what we would call, you know, the Hebrew scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament, were destroyed by the Babylonians mm-hmm. when uh, the people of Judah were taken into exile. And that after um, the return from exile, the prophet Ezra had a vision and rewrote them all word for word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Holy Spirit came upon Ezra and reproduced yeah. them uh, after they had disappeared from the world for 70 years. So I think, I think St. Siloan is in that <laughs> tradition of, right. The power of the Holy Spirit is what inspired the scriptures, but also what has preserved the scriptures through time. And that, yes, even if, you know the communists had had managed to destroy every you know or or you know whoever right <laughs> managed to destroy all the copies god could reproduce them right through the saints yeah right um so yeah and that's uh, it, but i think there's also as you kind of mentioned there's an important reorientation there mm-hmm. again to the holy spirit and to tradition of which the scriptures are a part no yeah rather than the text the book right itself right as to where the authority lies right in in terms of the church yeah maybe you can uh, uh, elaborate on that point the relationship between the bible and the holy tradition yeah yeah so the as i mentioned it's important that it's not just that the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures at the time they were written. As if then he just sort of walked away and it was sort of up to us <laughs> to copy them accurately and to preserve them and keep them around. Um, and this is this is one of the issues with even sort of conservative Protestant statements on the inerrancy of the Bible, for example. So there was a major statement that was made on inerrancy a few years ago that all kinds of evangelical leaders in the United States signed on to that said uh, that the the texts of the scriptures were inspired and inerrant in the autographs and the original writing when they were first written down. And we can now accurately reconstruct that using computer tools. (laughs) And it's sort of like, great. So Everyone else in the history of Christianity has had a Bible that's full of errors and and is messed up (laughs) and is not fully inspired, right? Until now with our computers where we managed to, right? Um, There's a bunch of problems with other problems with that too, including even what is the original, right? Is the original like what Moses would have written? in a language, a pre-Hebrew language, right? That we don't no longer exist, right? That we no longer have. Um, 
But the main problem with it is you're leaving out the role of the Holy Spirit down through history, guiding that process of copying, of of revealing what is and isn't scripture as these texts are being handed down in an authoritative way in the church. Um, I understand why from certain Protestant perspectives, you would want to avoid that because you run into a certain logical problem. If you're going to say, for example, that the Orthodox church who are the ones copying the Greek manuscripts of the new Testament, all of our, all of the things that we call Greek new Testament manuscripts and scholarship are Orthodox Bibles. <laughs> literally <laughs> they're orthodox bibles from the past and if you're going to say that within the church the holy spirit was guiding them to preserve the scriptures to copy the scriptures to compile the scriptures and that all of this was going on for centuries it becomes hard to argue that they got everything else wrong right like the holy spirit was only doing that <laughs> right? the holy spirit didn't care about preserving accurate doctrine or anything else uh Holy Spirit didn't help them read the scriptures they were copying. He just made sure they copied them correctly so that we could feed them into our computer in the 21st century. Um, that That's a hard argument to make. Uh, but it seems to be obviously the case. Right? That Obviously the case. And if it is, then, as I just said, it seems hard to restrict that to just the copying and preservation of scripture. Right. The people who are copying the scriptures are also the people interpreting them. They're also the people carrying on the traditions of liturgy in which those scriptures are read. Uh, the Living the Christian way of life that's being preserved. Right, And so the scriptures have this central role within the whole tradition. But uh, they are not something independent from the tradition the thing against which we weigh the tradition, um, that that tends to reverse the relationship. So when you talk about, like from a sola scriptura per perspective, well, we test all these things against scripture. What you're really doing is I'm in charge. The scriptures are the tool I use for me to figure out what Christianity is. And ultimately every individual not only has the right to interpret the bible privately the requirement to interpret the bible privately to decide what true doctrine is to decide what all these things are and then because in the protestant world they believe in sola fide they believe in salvation by faith by belief if you end up coming to the wrong answers and believing the wrong things you go to hell for eternity for it <laughs> that is an incredible burden to lay on the backs of regular Christian people and not lift a finger to lighten it, right? Uh, this is this is kind of horrific burden to place on people when the reality is the Holy Spirit has in the church preserved the Christian way of life, and that by entering into that way of life, right, we enter into the path of salvation. And so it's ultimately God, the Holy Spirit, right, <laughs> Uh, through the scriptures we've received, through the tradition we've received, who judges us, not vice versa, right? and who assesses how we've done at, at living within the community. So the reality is every community, every way of life, whatever it is, no matter how secular, quote unquote, what religion it's associated with, right, has texts which are canonical. Right. So if you go and join a Marxist group, right, Das Kapital, <laughs> right? Um, Engels, you know, marriage family in the state, right? There, there are the, the that's your that's your canon. Those are your canonical texts, right? That guide your way of life, that guide the way you view the world. People in that group are going to argue about various details of the interpretations of those texts, right? and how they should be applied and 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 all of those things right um and that's you know a group that's sort of deliberately non-religious right but um any other any other group the same thing people even talk about the western canon just western civilization in general right shakespeare plato right 
these great books. I have the great books of the Western world over there, right? Yeah. <laughs> these texts, which sort of are the can are the have this role, right? And so the scriptures are the texts that have that role in the Christian community and in the Christian life over against right those other texts. Yeah. Do you do you think I think it was Muslims that called Christians the the people of the book? or maybe Jews also. Do you think that's a, a right way of putting it? Or do you think there's more to the Christian life? Yeah, uh, I, yeah I, I don't think that's accurate. I think, and it was it was also Jews. And I think what they were trying to say was, that was them trying to sort of extend an olive branch, right? Because there, mm. there are different currents within Islam, even within the Quran. Um, so, for example, part of the Quran says that that Christians should or that Jewish people should follow the Torah and Christians should follow the Injil, right? The gospel. And and then Muslims should follow the Quran. Mm -hmm. Right. And for a more hardline Islamic person, that that causes a lot of problems. <laughs> right? um, but, you know, I think the idea there, it's hard to I mean, I'm not getting into uh okay. text criticism on the quran but because i don't know anything about it really yeah but i just know that there are things there um that's sort of an olive branch toward right well sort of this is maybe a thing we have in common but i think ultimately that's any given group tends to religious group mm -hmm. tends to see other religious groups on their own terms yeah right so um we we tend to think uh christians tend to view other religions as being like theirs right <laughs> and, and so does everybody else so i think in part that's that's muslims saying oh well, we have the quran right so the torah is like that for jewish people and mm -hmm. the gospels or the new testament is like that for christians right um but yeah so the the I think the biggest problem with that again is that it's it's reversing it's reversing that relationship um, because any any approach that sees the text as first and foremost ha foremost has a basic problem that there's no sort of root facticity to the text right any text can be interpreted a thousand different ways yeah any text at all not just the Bible. Um, and if you don't believe that, go take any university class now, right? When I went, did my PhD in biblical studies, right? There's feminist interpretation, queer interpretation, African-American interpretation, right? All these different ways, approaches, right? Of coming at, coming at the scriptures. And uh, the, you can't just say, well, no, <laughs> right there's this one that's just obvious there's this one that's just brute fact the one that seems obvious to you is just the one that's from the tradition you came out of so a calvinist reads romans 9 through 11 and it's obvious that it's talking about certain things somebody who's not a calvinist reads those same chapters and it's not obvious at all that it's talking about those things right it's obvious it's talking about something else um so you can't sort of have a text operating in a vacuum. You have to have a way to say, no, this approach, this interpretation, this context, this is the one that's normative for me and why. And so as Orthodox Christians, we can say, no, preserved within the tradition of the church is a particular way of reading the scriptures and a particular way of applying the scriptures. And that's normative for us because it goes all the way back to the apostles. So it's not just normative because we happen to pick this one because we like it best, but it's normative because of this historical connection, this historical tether back to the apostles to whom Christ <laughs> right, interpreted the scriptures. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, there are countless other ones. But I, I sometimes have this when I get into discussions about the Bible with people from a Protestant background is I'll talk about a scripture and I'll interpret it. And they'll say, well, couldn't you also interpret it this other way? As if the fact that there are other ways to interpret it makes my interpretation invalid. 
Yeah. Right. It's like, well, as a Protestant, you're going to be in real trouble if that makes it invalid. Because any scripture you want to use for anything, I could tell you 12 other different ways <laughs> right, that it could be interpreted. And now you can't use the Bible for anything. Hmm. <laughs> right? If, if yeah. you, you you can't have some means to say, no, this is the authoritative way to read it. Yeah, I think uh, St. Augustine made th that point also. Yeah. Uh, but do you, do you think that... The, you know the Protestant doctrine of uh, sola scriptura has also shaped the Orthodox understanding of the apocrypha in in the West. And uh, when I say Orthodox, I mean normal people. How we think yeah. about the Bible and the yeah yeah yeah. I I and um, I I think a lot of people fall into this that binary view. Either this is scripture and it's great and it's perfect and it's beautiful, or it's junk and it's irrelevant. And even even among even among uh, Orthodox people, and that was another big purpose for writing this book. Yeah. Is I talk about in in the book. I think these texts have the same kind of level of authority. For example, the New Testament apocrypha have the same kind of authority as like the Apostolic Fathers. Right, that that's a good way of thinking about it in terms of the way we talk about the fathers. We don't say that any given father is completely like inerrant, right? Never made a mistake, was absolutely right about everything, right? Because sometimes they do disagree about things, right? <laughs> that's um, you can usually get past that if you really study, but right, they they don't all say, oh, this text means this, right? Then yeah. they all agree, right? Um, so and that they have a kind of secondary authority where the these apocryphal books are helping us understand the canonical books so one i think really good example of that i think most people would expect me to say that the most important old testament related text i deal with is the book of enoch in this book it's not the most important one i deal with is actually the testament of the 12 patriarchs um because I will go so far as to say, if you don't understand or don't know about what's going on in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, particularly the Testament of Naphtali, the Testament of Levi, uh, you're not going to be able to understand St. Paul correctly. Mm -hmm. um, because he's bringing in ideas that we find in those texts. Not that St. Paul may never have read those t actual texts themselves. But the ideas that are reflected there are ideas that were current in Judaism at the time that St. Paul was a rabbi and that he was conversant with. And St. Paul all the time will just reference these ideas because at the time he was writing, these were well-known ideas. Uh, and so we have to kind of familiarize ourselves with the milieu in which he's writing, yeah. be able to sort of fully understand him. And there are little examples of this that I could point to, like when he talks about Israel having a rock that followed them in the wilderness and that rock was Christ. Everybody focuses on that rock was Christ. They don't focus on the word following. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's strange. Wait, the rock was following them around? Wait, what? Right? Well, if you get into the Midrash, you find out that was a tradition. And St. Paul just refers to it, right? Because, yeah, everybody knows about that, right? <laughs> um, or when he mentions uh, when Moses contested with Janus and Jambres which are were the traditional names of Pharaoh's magicians, right? That's not in the Torah, right? but that everybody knows that's their names, you know? Huh. Um, but he does that with more deeper and more, huh. you know, more important theological ideas too. And, um, and that really help exclude certain now very popular readings of what St. Paul is saying. Um, not in the Orthodox Church, but in other places. <laughs> That's, if you understand some of these ideas that he's working with, specifically surrounding how the Gentiles come to find salvation and worship the God of Israel, that there were already ideas about how this would happen when the Messiah came, before the Messiah came. <laughs> and St. Okay. Paul is appealing to a lot of those in understanding Christ and his relationship um, 
to the Gentiles. So, but I think it's it's that kind of role. It's it's helping us interpret and apply the scriptures. And that doesn't elevate them to the same level as the scriptures, right? The scriptures are still more important because that's what's being interpreted and applied. And I think that's important for Orthodox people also to remember with the fathers. No. Any church father would tell you that the words of the scriptures are more important than their own words. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that they what what the church fathers are doing is interpreting and applying the scriptures. And we yeah. believe they're doing that in a an authoritative way that we must emulate, but yeah. they're not on the same plane. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's the Holy Scriptures. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Um let's see. Maybe why don't we talk about those two uh, books, uh, the book of Enoch and uh, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs? Can you give us some? What do? Yeah, what what are they about, and uh, how are they? How are the traditions in the in them? You know, continue in the New Testament. You talked a little yeah. about that already, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So I should say, because I haven't mentioned it yet, that sort of what frames the book is a list made by St. Nikephorus the Confessor yeah. of Constantinople at the beginning of the ninth century, uh, where he lists the books that were considered canonical in all the churches, the books that were considered, that were read publicly in some churches, but not others. Um, which includes on the Old Testament side, the Deuterocanonicals. So he was testifying to some churches, he sees it, some don't. Um, and then the books which were to be read privately. And so that informs a lot of the table of contents and things in the book. Um, the reason I particularly bring that up here in this context is that uh, that list from St. Nikephorus was appended to a work by George Sinkelos. Um, Sinkelos was an official title um, in the Byzantine world. Uh, it literally means cellmate. <laughs> That's in English, but it's a monastic cell, not a prison cell. <laughs> and uh, he, George Sinkelos, shared a monastic cell with the previous patriarch the Patriarch of Constantinople before St. Nikephoros, and was an important advisor to the Patriarch, theological and otherwise, uh, and is primarily famous for having written uh, the chronographia, the uh, chronography in English, which was sort of a universal history uh, of the world. And one of the evidences for sort of the enduring influences of the Book of Enoch uh, so George Sinkelos is writing this at the very end of the 8th century, uh, is that when you get to the history of the world from creation uh, until the flood, he very clearly is utilizing the first Enoch, the Book of Enoch, as a historical source for that history even though it was well established by then that it was not canonical, was not being read publicly. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, it was still, not only is it on St. Nikephorus's list, but George St. Kellis had just used it as an authoritative historical source. Uh, so it stuck around a lot longer than people think. Um, the reason I put so much weight on St. Nikephorus's list is because of the date. People tend to have a view that, well, okay, yeah, first century, second century, maybe third century, people were reading the Book of Enoch because they thought it was canonical or might be. You get people like Tertullian arguing that it was canonical um, and that Enoch wrote it uh, and that uh, a copy must have been taken on the Ark during the flood. I mean, like lengthy, <laughs> try to explain how this could have been written by Enoch and things. So that did happen like in the third century. Um but it's not that sometime in the fourth or fifth century, we figured out this canon thing and then we dumped all that stuff, right? Um, there was still, even though it was firmly settled, uh, not, not canonical in the sense of being read publicly, these texts were still preserved and had this continuing, this continuing influence. 
uh, the book of Enoch is very influential in certain books of the New Testament, especially. There's little bits and things throughout, but particularly in St. Matthew's Gospel and the book of Revelation. Uh, there are a lot of references to things in the book of Enoch, the Johannine literature in general, um, 1 John, even though it's a relatively short letter, has several things that seem to be references to the uh, to the book of Enoch. Um, and of course, Jude quotes <laughs> First Enoch directly. It says, Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied saying. So he not only quotes the text, he quotes it as a quotation from the Enoch right, in the um in the genealogy of uh of uh seth in genesis um but uh, examples of where this comes in is the lake of fire imagery that christ uses when he talks about the fire prepared for uh the devil and his angels that same language almost exactly is used in the book of revelation again uh and the place where we see that in Jewish literature before the New Testament is the Book of Enoch. Um, the references even in in First and Second Peter to angels who left their former estate. Uh, the language regarding the chains of darkness is lifted directly from from First Enoch. Uh, in Second Peter, he actually says they're imprisoned in Tartarus, which is an interesting crossover because he takes the Titan story from a uh, greek myth and by using that word it's kind of and, and this is something that had already happened in jewish circles saying well this is sort of the messed up greek pagan version of the reality of the rebellion of these angels that's described you know in, in first enoch and alluded to in genesis 6 um so yeah there are there are a whole bunch of those things um even in the even in the Old Testament, uh, references to Mount Hermon, uh, you get important context <laughs> from uh, the Book of Enoch. Uh, Mount Hermon that comes from the same root as the Arabic word now Haram that means accursed or forbidden. So this is the cursed mountain or the forbidden mountain. It's in the Golan Heights. It's still covered with wrecked pagan shrines. Uh, there's uh uh at the base of it is what's now called Banius that was Panius that under the Greeks was a shrine to the god Pan. Uh before that it was a Baal shrine that was believed to be a gateway to the underworld. Um so there's a lot of there's a whole bunch and a whole lot more, obviously. This is very short TLDR version. Mm -hmm. Uh but you'll get a lot more out of the book with the book with the book of Enoch. Um the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs that I said is probably the most important thing. Uh, one, one just fascinating detail about it is we have manuscripts of these texts in two primary places. One of them is the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they're preserved from between the 3rd century BC and the 1st century AD. The other one is Mount Athos. So these are Jewish texts that were not preserved in Jewish communities. They were popular at the time of Christ, but were not preserved in rabbinic Judaism going forward, but were preserved in Christian monastic settlements. And we see this again and again and again with some of the things of the Old Testament section of this book, that they're preserved in Christian monastic settlements. Our manuscripts are from Marsaba, from Mount Athos, from St. Catherine's at Mount Sinai. Um, and these aren't just old manuscripts that were found back in a corner somewhere <laughs> they forgot were there these are being copied up through the 13th 14th 15th 16th 17th centuries right so the the monks at these monasteries are investing the time and effort to continue copying and recopying to preserve these texts which they all agreed were not part of the bible <laughs> we're not we're not canonical but still important um and basically, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, what it is, people are a little more familiar with the Book of Enoch, that it's apocalyptic literature and that kind of thing. But the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, testaments are a genre of literature uh, in, in Jewish literature from that period. 
uh, they're based around uh, Genesis chapter 49. Uh, Genesis chapter 49, sometimes referred to as the Testament of Jacob. Uh, Jacob is going to die, the patriarch Jacob. And so he gathers all of his sons together. And he's sort of, it's testament in the sense of, sense of like last will and testament. Right? He's, he's dying. And he sort of gives these words, these prophetic words to each of his uh each of his sons and probably the most well-known one of those is what he says to judah about the king coming forth from the tribe of judah we read that um and it's in a lot of our hymnography surrounding uh palm sunday the triumphal entry of christ into jerusalem um as the king from the tribe of judah but so that format was adopted for Jewish literature. And so during that period, we have testaments of everybody. There's a testament of Adam, right? <laughs> testament of Seth, testament of Moses, testament of, um, you know, just every figure, right? <laughs> testament of Abraham. Um, and the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs is a collection of the 12 sons of uh, Jacob. And it's... It, purports to represent their dying words there's a testament of reuben testament of simeon testament of levi testament of judah talking to their descendants as they're dying and these are these are written much later obviously than the historical people but so they talk about they present things as prophecy that have already happened <laughs> right like the exile uh and that kind of thing but they also um then contain a lot of uh what at the time would have been considered prophetic material traditions about the coming of the messiah uh the end of the exile right the reestablishment of the kingdom um and so there are kind of two primary elements that you find in those testaments one of them is uh teaching on moral virtue so a lot of the um, testaments will take some episode in the life of one of the uh, one of the patriarchs. So the testament of Reuben is talking about Reuben most infamously uh, slept with his father's concubine. That's why he was disinherited, even though he was the firstborn son. Um, and so it talks about sexual morality. So on that level, you can see the idea of virtues and vices being exemplified by these different figures, why that would be popular in a Christian monastic setting, right, in terms of monastic wisdom. The other piece then is sort of apocalyptic and those prophetic elements uh, about the future. Um, the Testament of Naphtali in particular, uh, because there's not much in Genesis about Naphtali <laughs> as a son, you know, they don't really have a lot to go with. Uh, they use Naphtali as sort of emblematic of the 10 Northern tribes of Israel. And what gets laid out there is that through those tribes, those, those 10 Northern tribes got dispersed among the nations and interbred with Gentiles and just kind of disappeared, right? Ethnically and genetically and everything else. But what you find in the Testament of Naphtali is the prophecy that this is the means by which the Gentiles are going to be brought into Israel. They were dispersed among the Gentiles, and so the Gentiles are going to come back and reconstitute those tribes. And this is very much what St. Paul is doing in Romans 11, for example. Really, 9 through 11. He's talking about um, those tribes. When he says, right, that, that Judah has been hardened until the time of, until the fullness of the Gentiles, <laughs> right, has come in. And then all Israel will be saved, right? He switches from Judea to Israel <laughs> there. And the difference between Judea and Israel is the other 10 tribes. And that phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles, comes from Genesis 48, 
and a prophecy about Ephraim, which was the largest of the 10 northern tribes. So um, that's just one example of one of those sort of apocalyptic elements. There are other things about the Messiah. Uh, the Testament of Levi talks about the Messiah's priestly role in addition to his kingly role. That's going to become important in terms of the way the New Testament uses Psalm 110, which both has, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, or 109 in Greek. Uh, <laughs> sit at, Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your, uh, your enemies your footstool. I have made you a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, right? Where those two things are joined. Um, so, yeah, that's, and that is why, um, and if you, if you pick up any modern academic commentary on any book of the New Testament, you're going to find references in there to the Testaments of the 12 Patriarchs. Because this isn't just something I discovered and nobody else knows, right? Like, <laughs> This is now they rediscovered it through the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? And and what I the piece I discovered is that hey, wait a minute, this was this text was being copied at Mount Athos this whole time. We sort of never lost it, even if we're not aware of it now. And so part of what I'm trying to do in this book and with all my books is say, hey, here's parts of our tradition that we as 21st century Orthodox Christians in the West maybe aren't aware of. And need to sort of reclaim, <laughs> right? Because they belong to us. They were handed down to us. You know, we just aren't as aware of them as we should be. No. Yeah. I think what you're saying here is so important because I think, yeah, many people are starting to realize that we need to study the Old Testament to better understand the New. Uh, but what you're saying here today, but all with and with your book, is that it's good also to study this other literature because traditions from them pass through the New Testament and are also kept in the Orthodox Church in, in different ways. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything is, you know, uh, accepted as such, but still the documents are, um, uh, yeah, used at least in monastic, uh, it seems, um, if I understood you correctly, in yeah. uh, environments. Yeah, and that's an environment where the people who are going to be reading them are in a position to be able to interpret them and weed out, like, okay, well, yeah, don't, you know, <laughs> yeah. forget about that part. But this here, this is, yeah, this sheds light here. This is, you know, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, one question I have uh, I have not, I have not read uh, uh, everything in your book yet, uh, but so I it's don't long. know. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you um, will deal with this later or not. But uh, at the end of the book, there are more. You're dealing more, I think, with books uh, in the New Testament era, uh, right? Or yeah. or some centuries early Christian era. Early, yeah. early Christian era. Uh, so something that comes up often in the scholarship today is that uh, is that people are trying to see Gnosticism as, or they're trying to widen the horizon of Christianity, let's say. So you have people like Bart Ehrman saying that we have now discovered that there are churches or christianities in the first centuries i would like do you have i don't know do you have any thoughts about that uh i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean assuming ed barterman does believe <laughs> that jesus of nazareth existed <laughs> yeah he wrote a book about that so <laughs> yes yes which he does he says the fact that jesus of nazareth was crucified right circa 30 a.d is the most firmly established fact of ancient history right so he definitely doesn't doubt that right? and that he had disciples right, to whom he communicated certain things 
and that those disciples began the Christian, well, let's say Christian movement, right? Give them as much as we want. Won't use the word church yet, right? <laughs> That's um, then that means that originally Christianity was a th one thing, right? Now it's certainly true that very early on you have people teaching things about Jesus that are other things, right? Because we have the apostles in the New Testament talking about them and calling them false teachers and calling them, <laughs> right? And rejecting what they're, they're saying, right? So we don't deny as Christians that there were these people, right? But there seems to be this, and 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 this is a thing that's in it's a weird thing in new testament scholarship um that somehow the well they don't they don't like to talk about the tiny gap between christ and saint paul writing because you've really only got like between 12 and 15 years right <laughs> between that christ and galatians right but um they want to talk about the first gospel. They want to say St. Mark, 69 AD. They want to say like, oh, this is almost 40 years later. As if in 40 years, everyone just forgets everything. Right? And you need a much bigger gap than that. Right? Like, um, 40 years ago now is 1983, but we'll go even farther back than that. You know, we'll we'll go back to the the, you know, for the U.S. the Vietnam War, right? If I knew absolutely nothing about the Vietnam War and every book on the Vietnam War had been destroyed, I can go and find people who fought in Vietnam, right? <laughs> and people whose children, the children of people who fought in Vietnam, and the children of people who were generals and politicians at the time. I could go to Vietnam and find people who fought on. You know, the North Vietnamese side, the South Vietnamese side. Just from direct testimony, I think I could reconstruct a pretty good history of the Vietnam War. Now, if you ask me to do that with the American Civil War, <laughs> right? Now you're going to have a lot of myths and, you know, all kinds of things entering in, right? Uh, over several generations, right? But But over like 50 years, Let's be extreme, say 50 years. Not really. Right? You could you can still find a lot of people. And St. Luke at the beginning of his gospel even says he went and talked to people. Yeah. <laughs> right. That he went and found people and talked to them about what Jesus said and what he did and, and, and these kind of things. So despite that, they want to impose this gap where sort of everything gets forgotten. And so then you can just have communities pop all over the up all over the place with their own versions of Jesus, and no one knows who is right. You know, and to me, Saint Irenaeus kind of wrecks that. Because when you look at his primary argument against the Gnostics, it's look, we're we're like the grandchildren of the apostles right spiritually right so he sat at the foot of saint polycarp who sat at the foot of saint john <laughs> right so we're we're not that far removed he's like you can go right to to rome right now and find people whose grandparents can tell you about meeting you know saint peter and paul or you could go to you know antioch same thing right and his uh, proof against them was what you're teaching is not what the apostles preach because we still have this living memory. Yeah. And that was much later <laughs> than, than, uh, than that. So to me, that's the main reason why that dog doesn't hunt. Um, it takes a lot longer than that for anybody to mystify. And, and even now, Right. I mean, if if you or I are talking to a Protestant about orthodoxy and we're trying to show no orthodoxy is like the religion of the apostles plug. Uh, <laughs> right. We can go back. Historically, we can go to early Christian writings. We can go to the. Right. The church fathers, we could go and say, no, we, we can trace these things back to the apostles. 
including some of these things that that mod a lot of modern Christians think are later innovations, like the veneration of the Theotokos or the veneration of saints or these things. We could show how these go back, in some cases, even before Christianity into Judaism. Right, these are these ideas. Um so I I don't think that's as tenable. You have to have this sort of great for, great forgetting or great apostasy, <laughs> right? In order to this historical disconnect, and I think that's it. I think the reason that came into New Testament scholarship, I think there's a couple reasons. First reason is um, that the uh, the disciplines don't talk to each other in academia. Patristic scholars, New Testament scholars, and Old Testament scholars are in these three different boxes and don't communicate. So, you know, it's amazing how many New Testament scholars. I mean, I've heard Bart Ehrman, who honestly, when, I, when we like on Lord of Spirits, we say he's a friend of the show. Uh, I'd love to talk to him sometime. He's actually a brilliant text critic. He's not a dumb guy. He's not right. He, he, he is a uh, legit scholar, but I've heard him make very basic errors about Hebrew in public lectures that he knew were being recorded because he just doesn't deal with the Old Testament. It's not his field. He doesn't deal with it. And say things that directly contradict stuff you could find in the Apostolic Fathers. Because again, patristics is not his discipline. And so everyone is so focused and not communicating that you get, it manufactures these historical breaks that aren't really there. Yeah. And the other reason I think is that the place where this was really bad, it's actually gotten better, especially in New Testament scholarship in the late 20th and 21st centuries. But the 18th and 19th centuries, especially among German scholars, was terrible. Um, <laughs> that's and that was that they were sort of taking a radicalized Protestant perspective. Because built into the Protestant perspective, for example, is the fact that the correct understanding of St. Paul's writings was lost, mm -hmm. at least between St. Augustine and Martin Luther. And if they've actually read St. Augustine in detail, sometimes even from St. Paul to Martin Luther. And I'm not saying this is a cheap shot. Mm -hmm. I went to one of the most prominent reformed theological seminaries in the United States. It was discussed in class as an open question whether anyone is was saved in between St. Paul and Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. And the answer given seriously was, well, we have to at least say St. Augustine. All right, so this is not just me doing a caricature. This is... <laughs> right. no. um, and so... If you already have that kind of idea in your head and you're kind of a radical and and not really a Christian anymore, frankly, with a lot of these German 19th century, early 20th century Germans, um, then having this huge gap of forgetting where real Christianity is lost in the first century, you know, is, is, is sort of de rigueur, even if it doesn't check out historically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, there were some theories that <clears throat> Gnosticism perhaps come from Judaism, but the critique there that's really convincing is that, well, that's kind of strange because one of the main themes in Gnostic texts is that, you know, the Jewish God basically is evil. Yes. <laughs> so, so you would yeah. not expect that kind of connection, <laughs> but somehow that can that point is never raised in connection to Christ on the apostles. Yeah. So th that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. A quick question. I think you will write about sec that in your book, you have a chapter on second Clement. Is that correct? Yes. Or, yeah. Or yeah. I deal with Clementine liter Clementine literature. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. so th this is my own like interesting in interest kind of uh, in this question about the date when do you think like those two works yeah. were compiled do you have a well view? yeah first first 
first Clement and second Clement, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take a look at my my book on second Clement, so I make sure I don't contradict myself. But first <laughs> Clement, first Clement, I think is very clearly Clement of Rome, right? The one who appears yeah. in scripture, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that's what I thought I said. Okay, good. <laughs> that's, so I I think second Clement uh, postdates that saint clement by a little bit <laughs> uh but not a lot like it's from the early second century i think okay instead of the late first um and i also i think that second clement is part of a homily mm -hmm. i think it's not actually a letter i think the same thing about hebrews <laughs> the new <laughs> testament that it's a recorded homily that's been sent out right mm -hmm. in, in written form um, so I, I think with, so there's this phenomenon that starts happening in the general epistles, um, where, uh, especially in the church around Rome, there seems to have been a tradition of after, uh, the death of a major figure, sort of the compilation of writings, sayings, teachings, right, being put together and circulated. So New Testament examples would be like the Gospel of St. Mark, which all the fathers tell us, right, after St. Peter is martyred, St. Mark records, right, St. Peter's testimony about Christ as, uh, as his gospel. Uh, but I think that's also I think that's also what Second Peter is. I think that's why the Greek is so different. I think First Peter actually came not from Saint Peter's pen, but from his mouth, and he had a scribe. Right? Um, and then I think Second Peter is a collection after the fact. And I think that's also how I account for the connections with Saint Jude's epistle, because Second Peter two is basically the epistle of Saint Jude. I mean, it's. <laughs> is that those both emerge from sort of the church in Rome, from St. Jude's preaching and St. Peter's preaching, which, guess what, weren't that different, right? The apostles' preaching was not all that radically different in content. Um, and I think I think Second Clement is probably the same thing with St. Clement, that this is after he's gone, but this is from that, comes out of that milieu, mm -hmm. records sort of, sort of his teaching and was then circulated sort of after the fact under his name. So using his name, like with second Peter is not a lie, right? Because this is. Yeah. Like maybe you can Peter. deal uh, with that question too. The, yeah. the lying part. Uh, which, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if that's lying, then you're going to have a real problem with like the book of Isaiah in the old Testament. Cause the book of Isaiah explicitly says, his disciples wrote down his prophecies and compiled them, right? But I don't think saying these are the prophecies of Isaiah, or even Isaiah wrote this, I don't think no. that's a lie, no. right? Because none, if, if the question of uh, which epistles were written by St. Paul is which ones did he sit down and write out longhand, the answer is zero. He wrote his name a couple of times, right? And he points to it and says, look, here, I'm writing with my own hand. <laughs> right? yeah, the rest yeah, of the time yeah. he wasn't. Um, it's one of those trick Bible questions, right? Who wrote St. Yeah. Paul's epistle to the Romans? The yeah. scribe actually identifies himself. Yeah. It's like, I, church, just write this to you. Yeah. <laughs> right. So... Right, that doesn't make it a lie. Right, there's just no. there's there's a process involved. Right, yeah. Um, that's a different case than, for example, First Enoch, which purports to be from Enoch, the seventh person descended from Adam, and uh, isn't. <laughs> right. Um, although, even interestingly, even like Saint Augustine, who rejected the Book of Enoch and its teachings in a lot of cases even he in city of god says well 
St. Jude does quote Enoch as saying something. And it is recorded here. So Enoch must have written something. And at least some of it must be contained in the book of Enoch. But basically, that would make this book so old that we have no way to determine what's what. That was where he actually came out on the book. That there, there are some... Tra- he even came out on the side. There's some traditions in there that go back to the historical Enoch, but you just, it's impossible to determine no. which ones. Um, I i don't even think I would go that far, right? I don't think we need to tie it back to the, the historical, the historical Enoch. But the question is, in terms of whether that's a lie, is were the original readers right the people who received the book or in the case of first enoch books because it's a whole bunch of enochic texts stitched together into one big text um did, were they being fooled right did they honestly think was that was there a sales job being done like oh no i have uncovered the secret right ancient text or did the original readers know what was going on Right, because if the original readers knew what was going on, then it's not a lie. No one's being deceived. Right, so there are texts, there are texts, Gnostic texts are some good examples where that's the case. Yeah. Right, so there there are uh, apocryphal New Testament texts, mostly Gnostic, attributed, for example, to Saint James. Right now we have the Epistle of Saint James in the new Testament that we say he wrote, (laughs) right. Or comes from him. Um, And then there are these other things, but one of the, one of the uh, differences that jumps out at you very quickly when you read one of those is when you read the epistle of St. James in the new Testament, he sort of identifies himself as James, right? The brother of the Lord. It's very low key, right? When you read one of those Gnostic texts, it's like, I, James, brother of the Lord Jesus, first bishop of Jerusalem, uh, you know, presider over all of the church and, you know, da 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 on and on and on, you know, you know, present this very accurate and complete testimony of the secret teachings that only I was, right? There's this huge long introduction where you get the the sales job to get you to buy the used car, right? <laughs> to try and prove you know, how important James is. Uh, And so when you see that, like red flags should go up. Yeah. Right. Because that's when one of these, that's not just a question of attribution or like the Testaments of the 12 Patriarchs, right? Nobody thinks those actually go back to the figures of Genesis, right? (laughs) um, But nobody thought that along the line, right? That's a literary device. So in some cases, it's sort of like we have a genre of historical fiction, right? Where someone will write, write a novel set during a historical period, maybe including real historical figures. But we know based on the genre of historical fiction, they're not claiming that, you know, oh, you know, Harry Truman spoke every one of these words <laughs> right on the date, right? And if you picked up a book of historical fiction and went to the author, you know, at a book signing and said, you're a liar, you know, how dare you, you know, Harry Truman never said that, you know, uh, everybody would just look at you like you're crazy because you didn't get the genre. Yeah. And so with some of these texts, it's the same kind of thing, right? If you ran up to a person and said, Levi did not actually say these words to his children and grandchildren, they'd be like, yeah, duh, like it's. No, <laughs> that's not what it's about, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't know if you want to get into that, but uh, another question in in this context is: Do you what do you make of uh, you know the all the textual critical arguments or historical uh, arguments? about which book Paul wrote or do you find them convincing or I don't know if you have ever yeah, uh, yeah studied that at any length oh, yeah. But... yeah so 
I think the problem again, well, there's a bunch of problems with that. Uh, the main means by which they're judging that, did St. Paul actually write it, is the style of the Greek and the vocabulary. So it's it's ling on linguistic grounds. So there's a bunch of problems with that. One being we don't actually have enough text from St. Paul, even if we include all of it, to constitute a writing sample that you could use to confirm or deny and that's that's not like just me saying that you can go to there are people who that's what they do for a living is they validate like somebody shows up and says i found this letter written by abraham lincoln right and they go and they look at all the available right abraham lincoln study his grammar choices his spelling and all this and then compare the new letter right those folks will tell you we don't have a big enough sample, right, with, with St. Paul's writings. Part of that is number of words, but part of that also is we only really have one type of his writing. Right? We don't have sort of a wide array of him writing in different contexts about different things. Um, so that makes those conclusions hard. But even more so, if you read closely... Not only does St. Paul have different scribes, different amanuenses who he's working with on different epistles, some of the epistles he lists a co-author. It says like Paul and Timothy too. <laughs> right, the church at. So now you've got a listed co-author. And not surprisingly, those where he lists a co-author are included on the, oh, St. Paul probably didn't write these. Right. I mean, so this is like if you listen to a whole bunch of the whole Council of God podcast. Right. And then you listen to an episode of Lord of Spirits and you're like, no, I've listened to a lot of Father Stephen. Like Lord of Spirits isn't Father Stephen because there's all this other stuff in there that, <laughs> like, that doesn't sound like Father Stephen. It's like, yeah, there's a co-host. Right. <laughs> um, so that's a problem. You have the different scribes, you have, you know, the co-authors, right? Even with Hebrews, you have the potential genre difference if this is really homiletic material. So when I talk about St. Paul's authorship, again, instead of a binary one zero thing, right? St. Paul wrote it, St. Paul didn't, right? We need to look at it as more of a spectrum because even on the ones that are closest to St. Paul, he's dictating it to someone, they're writing it down and making their own corrections and things. Then St. Paul's reviewing it, <laughs> right, and editing it, and then it's getting delivered and read out loud, right? Those are the ones that are closest to him, right? And then you've got ones with a co-author, you've got ones that are potentially, if Hebrews is something he preached that was then written down by someone else, right? <laughs> in text form and sent out they're sort of farther and farther away from him but saint paul is still behind all of them just sort of with with relative closeness to the actual wording of the text because even the people who want to say oh those were written after he was dead even you know hebrews they'll say oh yeah the content is all pauline the ideas are all pauline the thoughts are all pauline Right. It's like, well, yeah, if you just read them closely, you can see how those have more filters in terms of co-author and scribe between St. Paul and the text than the other ones do. And so the ideas are passing through more sort of screens, right, on the way to the text itself. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Um do you have time for some questions that I collected before sure. the interview? There are not many, but and some of them we have already talked about. Some are totally about the <laughs> other things. <laughs> so, but uh, um, okay. One person wrote me this. So, to my knowledge, there is nothing called apocrypha within the Orthodox Church. The longer canon, yes. One, how would Pater, that is father, yeah. <laughs> approach this issue with 
Protestants. Two, with what authority does the Protestants deny these books when Christ himself quotes them? So he, he's he's thinking more about the deuterocanonical books then. Right. And right. He's, he's thinking that we are calling those books apocrypha. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. it's a misunderstanding, it basically. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything yeah. to that well, question. So, yeah, like we were saying, the, the, there is a group of texts called Apocrypha, right, in the Orthodox Church. Uh, it's that category, like with St. Nicophorus, the books to be read privately. Um, the debate with Protestantism would be, are those particular Old Testament books canonical or are they apocryphal um so yeah the the christ or the apostles quoting them is not a good argument to say it's canonical and not apocryphal because for example saint jude quoting the book of enoch um saint paul quotes like menander who is a greek comic playwright <laughs> you know? so lots of things get quoted um uh Christ references the book of Enoch. Um so that doesn't necessarily make it canonical. Um you know that's that honestly that I, I don't think that's something we should really uh debate with Protestants because it's kind of part of the problem we have when we get into discussions with folks or debates with folks is that so there's sort of a place where our viewpoints divide. And then we travel in different directions and we end up way down the branch, you know, here and here trying to argue those points. And we really need to go back to where we split and argue that <laughs> right? um, rather than something down the chain. So I'm reminded of a friend of mine who's who's Protestant um, said to me once, you know, oh, my, my church had two services on Sunday morning. They had like an earlier service and a later service. And I went to both of them and I took communion at both of them. Do you think I shouldn't have done that twice in one day? And I had to kind of say, well, yeah, I don't think you should take communion twice in one day. But our disagreement about the Eucharist goes way back farther than that. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and so for me to even explain to you why we have to go back way back to some other issues. And so, yeah, I mean, because uh, uh, a Protestant can look at you and say, those books don't have authority in the church I go to. And that's true. <laughs> they don't in the church he goes to. Right. So ultimately, our disagreement with the Protestant person about those books is that they're going to the wrong church. Right. That's why they have from our perspective, the quote unquote wrong canon is that they're going to the wrong church, right? And so if they came into the Orthodox church, then those books would be canonical for them because they'd be part of the tradition that they're now a part of. So I think don't just say, well, you're in the wrong church, right? But, <laughs> but, but approaching it in the sense of, well, wait, what is it that makes something canonical? Right. It's these are the books we've received by our tradition. And then how do you know that the tradition in your church goes all the way back to the apostles? And the books that they used and found authoritative and handed down to us. Right. As opposed to ours. And I think we have the better case to be made. Right. That that the books that are authoritative for us are the ones that we've received all the way since the apostles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, are there any particular passages or stories from Apocrypha that are emphasized in Orthodox theology or considered to be of special importance? Yeah, I mean, I think you get... Well, just to use an example since I talked a little bit already about the Testament of Naphtali and that idea of the Gentiles coming into Israel, I was struck again this Holy Week at how much of that language, right, of the Gentile church 
of <laughs> right how much of that was reflected in our liturgics that under that and that's ultimately our understanding of saint paul but that goes back to those to those kind of ideas uh that's one that just struck me struck me very recently uh, you'll find a lot of things in the apocryphal acts of the apostles uh, that show up in the Synaxaria for different saints. So the acts of Paul and Thecla being probably exhibit A of that, um, especially I'm in the Antiochian uh, archdiocese. So St. Thecla is a, is a major, huge commemoration for us. And um those St. Thecla traditions are very much reflected, right, about her life. Um, the Acts of Thomas, which has some of the wildest stuff. If you're looking for just wild and crazy things, I know you haven't gotten there yet in the book, but when you get to the Acts of Thomas, there are some sentences in there that I'm pretty sure have never been published in an ancient faith book before. We'll put it that way. Uh, some wild things happen in that text. But um, the... Uh, the whole tradition of St. Thomas going to India yeah. to preach the gospel there, um, which was uh, rejected as ridiculous for most of modern history. Um, and uh, very recently, however, uh, there's a king who's referred to in the Acts of Thomas, King Guandifer. And that in particular was ridiculed by our 19th century German friends, right? Scholars. Um, as being ridiculous, there's no king by that name. It's not even the right kind of name, blah, 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 blah. And then it's a, probably a while back now. It's not as recently as it used to be when I started saying this. It's probably 20, 30 <laughs> years ago now. But they found a big cache of coins in uh, India at exactly the place where St. Thomas was remembered to have gone. Uh, stamped with King Guandifer's name. <laughs> Even spelled the same way. This king who never existed, supposedly. And so, even where, like, I'm not endorsing, like, that crazy stuff, I'm not endorsing every word of the Acts of Thomas. Sure, yeah. Right? And it's very clear that there was actually a Manichaean version of the Acts of Thomas, too, that was even wilder and weirder. Um, but uh, there are historical memories embedded in there that have that have proven to be accurate right and are part of the part of the tradition of the church we just have to make this important distinction same thing with the protevangelion of james we have to remember to make this distinction our church tradition does not come from these texts yeah. right these texts are just early texts, early documents that reflect those traditions that we can point to to prove the antiquity of those historical memories. So the origin of the tradition of St. Thomas going to India is that St. Thomas went to India. <laughs> Reality, the fact that it actually happened, that's the source, right? We have these early texts that record that. And now we have archaeological evidence to back up <laughs> that. Um, but you 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 don't need to give any kind of authoritative status at all to the text in order to say, well, here's an early attestation to the names of the parents of the Theotokos, right? Um, and if you think about it, if you were going to write even a heretical Gnostic text, like we were talking about with all the stuff about St. James using all these titles to introduce himself, you would want to put as much recognizable factual stuff in it as you could to try to convince people of whatever it was you were selling beyond that. Yeah. Right. So you wouldn't fictionalize everything. Right. Yeah. But I think is it the gospel of Thomas that like has one line exactly from the gospel and then a line yeah. from yeah. So, so, so yeah, and that may be the most surprising thing to people to find included in my book is the Gospel of Thomas, but it's actually on Saint Nicephorus's list, uh, and I'll, that'll tantalize people. Uh, and I get into in the chapter on it why that why that is, um, and some of the things that are 
that are going on there uh, with the Gospel of Thomas in particular. But it's a weird case because anytime a church father mentions the Gospel of Thomas, uh, they always say it's heretical and Gnostic. But some of those same fathers will quote sayings of Jesus as sayings of Jesus mm -hmm. that we only know from the Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, there's a whole interesting dynamic going yeah. on there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next question is uh, what is the level of inspiration, authority, and role that the Apocrypha has in the Orthodox Church? Yeah. So you kind of already talked about yeah, this. A little bit. Yeah. So it's if you don't want summary. to add anything, it's okay. <laughs> I'll just do a quick, quick summary. So inspiration, there aren't really levels, right? Inspiration is, is sort of the label we put on after the fact to the books we consider canonical, right? We say these are inspired by the Holy Spirit and that's why they're the ones we read publicly. But in terms of the authority and that kind of thing, it's similar to, and role, it's similar to like the apostolic fathers in that, right? We're not saying they're inerrant, we're, they're not on the level of scripture, but they're giving us helpful tools to interpret and apply the scriptures, right? And so they have that secondary kind of authority. Great. So, okay. So the next two questions has really nothing I would say to do with our discussion today, but um, one person, he's actually a journalist from Norway, but he asked that he, meaning you, father, uh, translates the Greek pistevo into faithful, faithfulness, not just faith. Mm -hmm. uh, which gives a rather different understanding of several Pauline verses. Uh, what is his academic foundation for this choice? Uh, does he mean my credentials, or does he mean? <laughs> no, he means what no, your. Is... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, this is this is. Um, uh, so, if you want, if you want, uh, I'll give you one of their own poets, Matthew Bates who is a Protestant, uh, wrote a book called Salvation by Allegiance Alone, uh, where he talks about this. You can also read uh, um, N.T. Wright's big book on, on uh, Paul, on St. Paul. Um, the bi couple... biography of Paul, I think. It's... No, not the biography, his big oh. chunk oh. and uh he has written so many volume. books <laughs> yeah yeah no this is his big two okay. volume <laughs> paul and the faithfulness of god um yeah one of the reasons nt wright publishes so many books he's a genius this way he has these big omnibus academic books and then he kind of breaks up the material out of them and some of it he puts in popular format, some of it he leaves in academic format and publishes separately. Mm -hmm. So like his biography of St. Paul is basically the biographical things from that big book mm -hmm. sort of pulled out, right? Um, but yeah, if you want a couple of, those are both Protestants, <laughs> right? So this isn't just me trying to undermine Protestantism. Um, reassessing what is included, that it's more like faithfulness, loyalty, allegiance, um, then faith, the way we usually use it to mean belief, like assent, assent to the truthfulness of a proposition. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. A small correction. I don't know if he's a journalist, but he works at the newspaper. So, okay. You know. Um, okay. The last question uh, is, uh, does the Orthodox Church see, see James' relationship with Christ as significant? And this person says that growing up a Baptist, there were li very little said about James. So, yeah, um, yeah I don't know. Well, we give it, we give him the title Theodelphos, which is uh, brother of brother of God. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and uh, uh, he was so he served as the first bishop of Jerusalem, which is an office to which he was appointed by Christ Himself. A lot of our Protestant friends will say, uh, well, it doesn't say that in the Bible. And I'll say, well, it sort of says that in the Bible. Um, <laughs> and here's what I mean by that. Um, so 
you have to put together a bunch of different pieces. So we have St. James appear in the Gospels, and he is not a follower of Jesus. It says that his brothers and his were not, right, followers of Jesus. We then see him in the book of Acts, and he's in charge of the church in Jerusalem. He's clearly serving as the, the overseer, right, and therefore the bishop of the church in Jerusalem. And when St. Paul in 1 Corinthians lists the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection, he says he appeared to James, his brother. That's an appearance that's not recorded anywhere in the Gospels, in, in the post-resurrection appearances of Christ. Right? So if you take what the scriptures then say together, not a believer in Jesus, right? Not a follower of Jesus. Christ appears to him after the resurrection. He's in charge of the church in Jerusalem, not one of the 12 apostles, right? It seems to me that the church's tradition that in that res post-resurrection appearance, Christ set him in charge of the church in Jerusalem is the only thing that really makes sense of the biblical data. Yeah. Um. And so that seems to me, if you have a better way to explain that in the scriptures, go ahead. But but mine will still have the advantage of being the tradition of the church for 2,000 years. So <laughs> that's, um, And so that's also a significant role. And it's under that authority that he's writing the Epistle of St. James. Um, if you look at, so there are a lot of folks, Martin Luther famously, although this gets overblown sometimes. Uh, not a big fan of the Epistle of St. James. Um, but if you really examine the Epistle of St. James and you compare it to Christ's teaching in St. Matthew's Gospel, you see the clear affinities, right, to, to what's going on, right, in, in both texts uh, intertextually. So St. James is very much carrying on uh, what... Uh, Christ was doing in terms of his leadership of the church of Jerusalem. There's the first bishop. And of course, his, his martyrdom we know about from extra biblical sources because he was an important figure in the larger Jewish community. So Josephus records uh, that he was nicknamed by some people camel knees because he had huge calluses on both knees from praying in the temple mm -hmm. for hours and hours and hours. Um, and that he was also ultimately thrown down from the pinnacle of the temple and then killed with a fuller's club by an angry mob uh, and was martyred, which was seen as a horrible, egregious, sinful act by Josephus um, and by other, by other parts of the uh, Jewish community. Um, part of the reason why he didn't become as, as as prominent in this subsequent history of the church, the way it say Saints Peter and Paul did, is that uh, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and expelled all of the Jews from the city. They could only come in one day a year to come and mourn the destruction of the temple, and that was it. And they did a de-Judification program across Palestine. And uh, so that kind of wiped out the Jewish Christian church, which is where St. James had this incredibly prominent role. So if you go to the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, St. James is still very, very prominent. Make no mistake, right? But he doesn't, in terms of the overarching Christian tradition since then, which has been a Gentile Christian tradition in the Gentile church, other figures like St. Peter and Paul have had a greater prominence because of that. Okay, Father, thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate your time and uh, uh, and your work, uh, especially uh, the part of the work that I have been following more closely is your, or your books. So really really appreciate that um yeah i think i have we have talked now for like 90 minutes <laughs> and uh, i don't know if you want to end with something um 
else that you, you think we should have talked about? Yeah, no, I think um I hope this book will this book will be helpful to a lot of people. Uh the next thing coming realistically it's not going to be published until sometime next year, but the next thing coming is going to be my own big fat thing on uh St. Paul. Okay, uh, well. So... <laughs> yes. Well, that would That's be why I've been thinking about some of the other yeah. things we talked about. Yeah. Um so that's sort of the thing book wise that'll be that'll be on yeah. Main, so yeah that would be very interesting to to read so we will wait for that patiently <laughs> and uh, yeah again thank you father uh, for this time and uh, go and read his book uh, again it's called apocrypha an introduction to extra biblical literature and if you haven't, Father uh, Stephen has also other books, so you can find on the ancient faith and other places. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you soon again.